Hi, and welcome to Primate Concert Conversations. Um, it is my honor to introduce to you today, Susan Chain, both an inspiring academic and a leader in primate conservation. Susan is a senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University, right down the road from us, and the co-director of the Borneo Nature Foundation, as well as Brink, which focuses on conservation research in the central highlands of Borneo. For many years, Susan has carried out research in Southeast Asia and Indonesia, and is currently leading a long-term study of given behavior ecology and socioecology, as well as a study of given population density and distribution across Indonesian Borneo. Susan also works with red langers and oversees the continuation of the first long-term study of the species in peat swamp forests. In addition to her research on primates, Susan has also carried out surveys on flying fox hunting in abundance and is interested in how anthropogenic factors affect biodiversity. On the conservation side, Susan works with several IUCN specialist groups working on conservation policy, including pangolins and cats, and is the vice chair of the IUCN section on small apes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Susan. And with that, I hand things over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thank you to uh, all the organizers. Um, and thank you to those of you who have come along to watch. Um, what I am going to do now is share my screen, which in theory will work. Press much buttons, there we go. So, <laughs> Gibbons of Asia. I've given a very broad title because there really is quite a lot to talk about. Um, and I'd like to take you on a fairly uh, broad but hopefully interesting and exciting tour of Gibbons of Asia, some of the work that is being done uh, by myself, by uh, colleagues within the um, IUCN section on small apes, and, and sort of bring this together and look at research, education, outreach, online trade, um, and a whole bunch of different things that are that are happening. We have got uh, 20 species across 11 countries. Uh, so there's no way that I can give you a full overview of everything in, in just an hour, but I will do my very best. So the mission for the section on small apes is to strengthen coordination among given conservation projects worldwide, increase awareness of scientifically sound best practice within given conservation, and provide IUCN endorsed guidelines to conservationists, field scientists, policy and decision makers, as well as developing action plans. And I will talk about this towards the end because this is one of the very uh, key um, activities that the SSA is attempting to do. We want to, of course, ensure that the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species is updated as much as possible so it can be used as a decision tool and, of course, a tool for funding and provide direct technical support to implementing projects which are engaging with given conservation. So the idea with the SSA is really to bring together projects in in situ and ex situ to make sure we have a really nice link between um, wild, captive and zoos. And I've just realized I've totally forgotten to introduce my, um, my little friend. This is Luke Skywalker. And what I discovered, he's going to go and sit on top of my computer. Um, because what I've discovered is that when I'm presenting on Zoom, I can't actually see the participants, especially when it's being shared live. So what I do is I talk to Luke and therefore the force is with me. And since I will be talking about the Skywalker Gibbon in a little bit, it seems very apt that he should join me. So now that Luke is in place, we have 20 recognized species of gibbons, um, and that picture is slightly moved, but anyway, 11 countries. So we've got five critically endangered, 14 endangered, and one categorized as vulnerable. But at least three species that we know of have no captive breeding. This is the Hainan gibbon, the Calvit gibbon, and the Skywalker gibbon. So they don't exist in captivity. They're not in zoos, as far as we know, they're not particularly affected by the uh, primate pet trade, which I will talk about later. Um, but this also means that we don't have a reservoir or a backup uh, population from which to potentially consider reintroductions um, and uh, translocations. 
So these are concerns. So just to give you an idea, the gibbons, the little apes, the wee apes, there is nothing lesser about them. Um, as I said, 20 of them in four genera. Um, Symphalangus, uh, the siamang, in it's uh, a genera of its own. We've then got three hulocks. We've got eight namascus. I'm having to count as I go along, sorry about this. And then we've got the Hylobates gibbons. And this is a little infographic. It's available on the SSA uh, website for free as a training um, and educational tool that can be shared. Um, but the, it's, it's to give you an idea of the, the variation amongst the gibbons, the similarities, but also the differences. And this is what they look like in, in, in real life. As I said, there's 20 of them. They are beautiful, charismatic, singing, swinging apes. Um, they are apes, not monkeys. Um, and we have got 20 species to protect. And we have to work across multiple landscapes, multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions in order to be able to actually gain suitable protection for, for these uh, little apes. So just an idea of, of the broad distribution um, across the countries in which, in which you will find them. Obviously, some countries have more fragmented forest blocks uh, than others. And hopefully, oh dear, uh, if you can see my mouse, you can see this tiny dot here on the island of Hainan off the southern coast of China, which is home to the Hainan gibbon. The Hainan gibbon is the most uh, threatened, endangered gibbon, ape, possibly primate in the world. Uh, there are currently no, uh, a known population of only 32 individuals in one national nature reserve in one area. So um, these are particular, particularly problematic when it comes to thinking about uh, population growth in breeding, genetic diversity, um, the possibility of stochastic events which might come along the area is prone to typhoons um, if there's a problem with food availability um, and various action plans and emergency response plans have been developed to um, really try and think about how we can actually help the Hainan gibbon and again these are all available on the SSA website and the links to that will be um, at the end of the talk. So, gibbons have sadly received comparatively relatively little attention when it comes to uh, looking at publications. So this is going back to 1987. Um, these are data taken from um, Web of Science. So we've got a lot going on with chimpanzees. We've got a reasonable amount going on with gorillas. Um, a closely related amount uh, being published on the orangutan. If we take the three small gibbon genera, Namascus, Hylobates, and Hulok, we're even less. And right at the bottom is publications on the CMI. So when we think about uh, information that we're understanding about the apes, all of them, big and small, uh, gibbons are definitely getting the short shift. There's just not that much out there about them. And we need to improve that because conservation, protection of these species can only function um, if we have solid, sound, scientific information. So we have knowledge gaps, obviously. We have many knowledge gaps, but what we know, um, that should actually be 11 countries, sorry, um, but we definitely have 20 species and over 60 years of research into conservation action and, and science uh, about the gibbons, concentrated on uh, gibbon species. What we also know is that uh, broadly speaking, there are several priorities which affect all gibbon species. I'll talk about individual uh, species in, in a wee bit. We want to minimize population isolation by preserving metapopulations and connecting habitat 
And we need to think about things like canopy rope bridges, which have proved to be relatively effective in places like Hainan and Vietnam, uh, Malaysian and Indonesian Borneo. Optimize law enforcement, and I'll go into more detail about the um, trade in gibbons. We have to stop the hunting, it's not sustainable. And stop or control habitat loss and forest conversion, particularly when it comes to things like fragmentation. Again, a broad approach, looking at habitat protection, connectivity, population monitoring, captive management, and how that can feed into, into the wild, both looking at uh, gibbons in zoos and gibbons in sanctuaries and rescue centers. We must include humans in the um, uh, equation. We must consider them. We must consider what the barriers are to conservation, what the barriers are to engagement. So think about communities, outreach, and education and consider translocation where necessary, especially in areas that are highly prone to development of, for example, palm oil. We know a lot, we know a fair bit, to be fair, about what, uh, how orangutans are affected by palm oil. We have relatively little information on how gibbons are affected. Do they use plantations? Do they enter plantations? Um, what do they do within those plantations, if anything? We need to stop habitat degradation through fire prevention and limiting and preventing encroachment from settlements and combating new road construction. So we need to think about spatial planning. We need to think about infrastructure planning. And we need to involve given habitat in red, the reduced emissions through deforestation and degradation plus, and our carbon credit schemes. And some of these have already been um, implemented, but we need to think about how we can bring policy more into the conservation arguments. As I said, we must work with local communities to protect forests, especially those outside current protected areas. Establishing community or cultural forests, which is a particular drive of the Indonesian government. Optimizing law enforcement by establishing effective patrols and clear collaboration between all law enforcement organizations. And one of the ways we can do this is using new technologies for effective management. We can use SMART which is the spatial monitoring and reporting tool. Uh, this is being used for the Calvit gibbon in Vietnam, white cheek gibbons in Laos, uh, and has been implemented across multiple different uh, platforms. And it allows the patrol teams to quantify and um, regulate and establish data relating to the activities that they are doing. So instead of simply having patrol teams going out and wondering you know, without direction throughout the forest. It gives them structure, it gives them planned routes. It allows them to upload information relating to illegal activities um, and to have this in a customized database. Um, if anybody hasn't used this before, I really do recommend um, investing in it. It is a development of the Zoological Society of London, but it's, it's free software. So I mentioned the rope bridges earlier, um, and there's a variety of different ways, and some of these have been implemented in South America as well for uh, South American monkeys. Regeneration of the forest, of course, wants to be our um, end goal, but until we can get to that point, trees do not simply grow overnight, unfortunately. Rope bridges can be an effective tool particularly looking at allowing arboreal primates to cross roads, to cross fragments, to get between gaps. And from the information that is slowly starting to come out about uses of these bridges, if you build it, they will come. Um, reference to a movie, if anyone gets that. Um, Field of Dreams, possibly. Uh, so it's worth in it's worth looking into. Of course, you need to think about when building it what material you're using. You need to think about the location. You need to think about the distance that the animals are going to be crossing. All of these things. It's still very much a um, a developing conservation tool, I would say. And just as an example, um, how you do it: wood, ropes, 
um, giving the animals plenty of substrate in order to be able to grab onto things. You probably want ideally a couple of ropes or bridges in one location so you don't end up with a bottleneck of um, potential conflict area where two groups might meet each other. Um, you want to think about using natural material. You also want to think about the degradation of that material and how you um, go ahead and construct it. Think about health and safety. And many of these aspects of um, bridge construction can actually be learned from uh, what people are doing in zoos when they create substrates that primates can actually use. So there's again, a lot of crossover. We need to monitor populations. We need long-term data. We need to survey forests outside of current conservation protected areas. And we need to look at things like a population habitat viability analysis using things like uh, the vortex modeling uh, software, which allows us to predict into, I think about a hundred years into the future, depending on various anthropogenic disturbances, how a population of animals, primates or whatever, might respond. We can look at things like spatially explicit capture recapture to allow us to monitor populations over time. And we can use these data in order to make management decisions. If we increase the, uh, sorry, if we decrease uh, the amount of uh, the, num the fires. Again, this is a, an Indonesian specific example because that's where I've been working really for the last, gosh, 20 years. Uh, forest fires are a big problem. So if we can decrease the number of forest fire events, how will that benefit the population of species that we are looking at? And of course, with any kind of modeling software, it's only as good as the data you input to it. So we need science, we need boots on the ground, we need data about the population, we need data about their behavioral, behavioral ecology and social ecology in order to inform the model in the best possible way. Thinking about captive management, optimize rescue centers and rehabilitation centers to receive gibbons from the pet trade and carry out effective reintroduction following IUCN guidelines, which are put together by Given experts. All ex situ institutions, and you know, I'm, I'm talking about zoos really here, should have a tangible link to in situ conservation, funding, direct rehabilitation, helping with releases. So we really want to strengthen the international community involvement, and we want zoos to be a part of the conservation conversation. And we want to use standard husbandry, breeding, and welfare guidelines across the board. One of the activities that IAZA, the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, are working on at the moment is welfare and husbandry guidelines, which we hope to be getting translated into multiple languages, particularly, obviously, languages in which, uh, for, for given habitat countries. And I've forgotten to include this, but um, I will do that uh, I can do that later, but another of the uh, primate specialist group outputs has been a best practice guidelines about primate selfies. And we've got those in multiple languages now, again, available on the SSA website or the um, uh, primate human interaction website. And just to encourage particularly conservationists and primatologists, just think about the images you're posting online and what kind of message that is portraying to the general public. Humans, must include humans. We have been again, um, in terms of best practice guidelines, there's information out there about best practice guidelines for ecotourism for the big apes. We are working on a document about ecotourism for gibbons. And think about, you know, only where there's a large and stable population with appropriate clear risk assessments, particularly now that we're, you know, obviously uh, no longer able to travel and hopefully at some point we will be able to again, but we need to think about appropriate protection. So the guidelines on development of wildlife tourism must be thought about. We want to improve awareness campaigns and education programs through electronic printed media, posters, school visits, online media, online material, 
uh, gibbons as mascots, mainstream conservation of gibbons being considered in regional planning and linking education into schools and universities and local culture at home um, in habitat countries and abroad. Translocation is a particularly controversial topic. It can be difficult, it can be difficult, it can be dangerous. Um, it's obviously something um, not to be carried out lightly and not to be carried out without a risk assessment. Oh, sorry. Uh, oops, gone the wrong way. Um, and there's multiple reasons why we might want to think about translocation of, uh, of gibbons. Loss of canopy continuity, isolation of uh, individuals in a small number of trees, fragmentation, uh, areas, situations where gibbons may have to come down to the ground to find food or to, or to traverse between forest fragments. And there's a risk of uh, malnutrition, coming into contact with dogs, a whole bunch of different problems. Successfully has been done in Indonesia and in India, um, particularly in, in India where they pioneered it and had Hulot gibbons moved into larger forest fragments. Gibbons were rescued and moved and successfully reintroduced without any um, subsequent injuries. So, moving on to the online trade. We are starting to see fewer and fewer gibbons being sold in markets, um, physical markets, because what's happening is uh, they're all popping up on social media, particularly Facebook, although Instagram um, is uh, a culprit too. Posts of gibbons, um, when we, we started looking into this in um, probably about four years ago, and this is obviously not a problem unique to Indonesia, but because it's somewhere that I've spent most of my time working and I speak the language, it was it, I was able to, uh, you know, seek, seek out these posts and then engage others in order to be able to investigate this further. So we were searching keywords, gibbon, siamang, uh, various different words that mean gibbon in Indonesian, monyet, monkey, doll, uh, doll sail, exotic, uh, animal, all these kinds of things were coming up. And most of the records we were seeing come from Indonesia. It's an incredibly populous country with an incredibly wide uh, mobile phone coverage, as in I think the numbers are something like 78% of Indonesians have at least one mobile phone. So they are, you know, they're online, they're connected. So looking at the annual fluctuations in gibbon trade, what you can see in the green um, is, are the people who are wanting to sell a gibbon. In the red, it's people who are uh, wanting to buy a gibbon. And in blue, the total number of individual gibbons observed for sale, taking away any um, duplicates. And we can see a fair fluctuation, but reasonably high numbers. When you look at the key words used, uh, wa, which is gibbon um, in Indonesian, siamang, uh, again, it's the, the siamang with the throat sack. Uh, unko, a, a Sumatran word for, for gibbon, some with no keywords, uh, black monkey, uh, some of these other words that are, that are coming out. But as you can see, you don't have to go in and use um, alternative words. You can simply type in the Indonesian word for gibbon into Facebook and you'll come up with, with a gibbon for sale. If we look at the locations of, of sales, and something's gone slightly wrong with the text there, but never mind. Um, basically, what you can see, uh, this is the archipelago of Indonesia. Um, and you've got density of trade accounts by province, where you've got red is high, orange is medium, blue is low, and uh, gray is absent. And what we're seeing is that the uh, gibbon online trade occurs across five of the Indonesian islands. 
as far as we are aware. That's Java, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and Bali. Um, East Java, uh, or sorry, Java in general, 383 uh, total Facebook user accounts were selling gibbons. Um, the main province selling gibbons in Sumatra, and again, I hope you can see my mouse, um, is Riau with 55. Uh, not quite so much coming out of uh, Indonesian Borneo, but certainly we are seeing the hotspots on the islands of Java and Sumatra. And again, if you look at the, uh, the species that we're seeing online, what we're seeing predominantly, nearly 50% of it is the Siamang, followed by the Agile Gibbon, followed by the Javan Gibbon, and then in red and yellow, uh, the two uh, main Bornean species of gibbons. And what I should point out about this, and what's interesting is these are animals that are not going into the international market. These are animals which are being uh, captured in Indonesia, sold in Indonesia, and sold to people living in Indonesia. We're also seeing that the vast majority of the gibbons that are being sold are less than three years old. In fact, in fact most are less than two. Um, and again, the, the data are borne out by this. So you can see the juveniles in blue, adults in green, um, and unidentified in red. And the unidentified are because sometimes the infants are simply so small, uh, it's very difficult to actually determine what age they are. When it comes to how this is reported in the media, um, we, we see an increasing trend in the frequency of annual publications mentioning gibbon seizures in Indonesian media. Seizures obviously have uh, declined in 2020 due to the pandemic and, and the um, difficulty of, of going out and monitoring much of this activity. When we look at the annual number of court cases involving gibbons and the number of live animals and body parts involved, again, there are trends that are happening. We've got the number of cases in red, live gibbons in uh, green, um, and live gibbons and or parts in blue. And there's been a spike in 2020. Total wildlife related crimes in the, the green bar resulting in court cases. The green bars are the numbers which resulted in a court case being brought. Um, and the total number of people charged is in the orange bar um, from 2011 to 2019. So you can see that prosecutions are increasing for illegal wildlife trade. However, oh, no, hold on to the, hold on to the, a, however. What we're also seeing, of course, is increasing pressure and demand on sanctuaries and rescue centers. If we are promoting and pushing for gibbons in the pet trade to be um, returned to a sanctuary or a rescue center or a rehabilitation center, we have to ensure that those centers have the capacity and the facilities in order to be able to look after the gibbons coming into their care. So one of the things that was done was looking at in-house training and the uh, prosecution and prison sentence uh, and or uh, fine that was imposed pre and post in-house training. Uh, on the top bar, you can see after in-house training, there was an increasing uh, trend towards longer sentences and more uh, fines, uh, higher fines than there was before the in-house training took place. How am I doing for time? Cool. Gibbons are being sold as far as we can work out from about 150 to 540 US dollars. And in many cases, that's the equivalent of at least one month's salary. So these are animals that are being bought by people with disposable income. They're bought, being bought by people who are online savvy. So that's an interesting thing to look at in terms of the demographic of who's actually buying a gibbon. However, 
the annual offtake is simply not sustainable. These numbers are particularly um, relevant for the Javan gibbon, whose numbers are estimated to be about four to four and a half thousand individuals left in the wild on the island of Java. Um, when we think, of course, to catch an infant, because as I said, the, the vast majority of the, of the gibbons being sold are less than three years old, which means they're still dependent on mum. So, so to get that baby int gibbon, you have to kill the mother. The impact of shooting mum, so the bycatch, plus the societal implications for the rest of the family, the adult male, any juveniles or sub-adults within the group. And we simply don't have enough information about the, the direct costs um, on the wild. But it, you know, for, for one individual um, baby gibbon, you could, and, and the fact that that, you know, one individual baby gibbon might not survive transport from capture site to uh, market, so you have to get another one. You could be looking at the loss of two families per baby gibbon who ends up in the pet trade. And that's a lot of individuals that are potentially being lost from the wild and it is not sustainable. So we need to think about reducing demands and we need to think about um, social science when it comes to this. Social cognitive learning techniques and behavior change and we need to think about reducing demand. So reaching out to online and in-person vendors to explain the problem reaching out to tourists before they travel. So please, you know, don't take a selfie with, well, a gibbon or any wildlife. Reaching out to Indonesians online with a positive campaign of non-ownership. But we do and must consider the rescue centers and how they can cope with the influx of donated and confiscated gibbons and who is ultimately going to fund it. So thinking about triage, the rescue and rehabilitation. So in yellow, um, slightly removed, but you can roughly in yellow um, are the sites where we've got um, rescue and rehabilitation centers. We don't have any in Bangladesh uh, or Myanmar. Uh, there is a planned one for, uh, for China. So understanding the sources where the gibbons are coming from. Where are they coming from? Who's hunting? Why are they doing it? Uh, who's paying for it. As I said, the buyers do appear to be affluent with disposable income, but we need to work with communities in and around given habitat and act for behavior change through positive online campaigns. And one of the examples of this is Kukanku, which means uh, my slow loris. Uh, and this was a very effective campaign that was run a few years ago. And the sister campaign to that is Gibbonesia. Um, and I will share the links for that um, at the end. So, oh. this is more of a problem with um, photo, prop, photo prop trade in Thailand, where gibbons are dressed up, where they are given to tourists and have their photographs taken. Um, and again, awareness raising amongst foreigners as much as is needed amongst uh, local uh, inhabitants of given habitat countries. We really need to reach out to everyone. This is not uh, an Indonesia only problem. So we need to work together online uh, to deal with this because uh, it is an epidemic and it's not only gibbons. There are multiple different species that are being sold online in these um, Facebook menageries. Funders can help raise awareness and channel resources to help deal with the issue. I encountered a fairly big problem trying to find funding for Gibbonesia um, because the illegal wildlife trade funders said they would not fund it because the animals are not crossing international borders. I'm like, but it's still illegal trade. Anyway, rant about that later. Sending gibbons back from zoos is not a good use of resources, given the scale of online trade problems. There are so many animals uh, being kept as pets in habitat countries that re repatriating animals from zoos simply isn't effective. 
So Facebook and Instagram are definitely complicit in facilitating illegal trade and not only of primates. Removing the posts doesn't solve the problem because the vendors simply set up another um, account. Social media platforms need to be working with local law enforcement. And if anyone is interested in this further, I encourage you to look at the link at the bottom of the screen, Countering Crime, um, which is not only looking at the illegal wildlife trade, but illegal trade in um, a variety of other things, including arms and people and drugs and antiquities. But there are issues with privacy laws, and this is one of the um, counter arguments that Facebook has about uh, sharing information with law enforcement. So there are still issues there to be explored. So we need to target current and prospective owners through positive online campaign, work with um, campaigning organizations to lobby social media platforms to really take responsibility and work with rescue centers to ensure they have the capacity to receive gibbons and to reintroduce them where possible. So I've presented a slightly negative um, perspective on, on, on the wildlife trade. So I'd now like to come back to some of the positive things that, that uh, Gibbon groups uh, and things are doing and talk a little bit more about some of the science behind how we're using that in order to conserve Gibbons. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about the work that I do with my NGO, Borneo Nature Foundation. Here you can see a picture of kids. Hopefully you can recognize the picture is not a gibbon, it's an orangutan. Uh, talking about deforestation. We have our children's book, The Little Gibbon Who Lost His Song, which is in uh, both English and Indonesian. And this is my most favorite bit. You can, from the comfort of your own home, come to the jungle. You can come to Borneo. We're in the middle of a pandemic, doesn't matter. You can still come to Borneo and you can meet Phil, who's an orangutan, and you can meet Chili, who is a gibbon. And from the comfor comfort of your own home, turn your environment using augmented reality into the jungle. So you can see here on the right, this is my living room, uh, and this is Theo in my living room, and I'm following him. So available on multiple platforms, free, go on, go and get the Wild Diverse game. Um, you can also follow chimpanzees and gorillas, which is far less exciting. Um, but these are all based on real animals, real data from, from BNF and from other projects in Africa. Um, Great tool for kids if, you, if they're bored. You can, you know, you can get them to collect data on the, get their journal up to date, speak to researchers, interact with the avatars. Great fun. Just try not to fall over, fall over your coffee table, which I did. So I said about Skywalker, here we are. The Skywalker gibbon is the most recently described species of gibbon. Um, described in 2018 and occurs on the um, western part of China and the eastern part of um, Myanmar. And we know relatively little, in fact we know really very little, nothing about its distribution and um, density in, in Myanmar and this is a project I'm working on at the moment with many exceptional colleagues to do projects uh, out in Myanmar. Um, the recent coup that has just happened, I don't know how that's going to impact the field work, but we shall see. One of the uh, key things, so this is working with Cloud Mountain, whose logo you can see. Oh, ah, there we go. So it's talking to people, it's raising awareness, it's identifying areas where this particular species actually occurs, finding out, letting people know that the animals are there. All of this important work with kids, with rangers, with um, wildlife guards is all super important when it comes to outreach. Project that I was uh, fortunate enough to do my PhD with um, 
couple of decades ago, oh dear, um, the Callaway Project in Indonesia. And they work uh, not only on the Hylobates albibarbus, but species in Sumatra as well. And the founder of Callaway, Chani, had this wonderful, brilliant idea to create a radio station. So they do rescue, they do outreach, but he does a, he has a radio station. It's, um, for those of you in the UK, it would be like Radio One. It is the most popular station. It's popular music from Indonesia and around the world with conservation messages. And my organization, Borneo Nature Foundation, have been working with them to get messages out there about conservation. You can also, there's Callaway TV as well. And you can stream this uh, through, uh, through the web. So a little bit more about some of the work that I've been focusing on, um, uh, on Borneo. We have got uh, four species on Borneo plus a hybrid zone. So Albibarbus, Aboti, Funerus, Mulleri, and then the, um, the hybrid zone in the heart of Borneo, which you can see here. Um, four beautiful gibbons. They're all beautiful. I may have mentioned that. And one of the things from my long-term field site um, in Sabanga, where we've been working, uh, studying gibbons since 2005, is their site fidelity. What you can see in the middle here is, um, is one group, group C, uh, and their home range plotted over multiple years. Now, while there is some variation, what we have determined is actually the core area that they will vigorously defend so the, um, yeah, the core territory, as opposed to the home range, the core remains pretty much completely stable over, uh, we published this a few years ago, so this is over 15 years. And other given groups do exactly the same thing. So disturbance to their environment certainly will change things like mental maps that the Gibbons use. They know this area very, very well in a great deal of detail. Um, so disturbance that means they have to change the core part of their territory will cause uh, will cause problems. Up in our um, in in different in another site in um, in Sungai Wine, we've been looking at in the eastern part of Kalimantan, uh, and we've been doing this in multiple sites as well. But we've been looking at population density. Um, and the interesting thing that you can see from that is that we've got, uh, again, from, we've got data from 2012 to 2018, we can see a slight increase in the population size through doing detailed and um, consistent population monitoring. When we look at uh, singing data, given sing, as I mentioned, they are the singing swinging apes. Um, and we can look at uh, duet and solo times. Quite often, it will be the adult male who will start. And then hopefully, if he's lucky, his um, adult female partner will join in. Um, I have had mornings when I've been up at, you know, 4, 4.30 a.m. Um, and literally, the, the forest is filled with male gibbons singing and not a single female has joined in. They're obviously having a lie-in. But we can look at start and start times. We can look at when the gibbons decide to join in. We can look at the influence of weather factors on singing behavior and whether or not rain has an, inf an influence. So we can look at the lunar cycle and the temperature and how this affects this very important social component of gibbon behavior. And then we've got Hylobates avoti from the northwest of uh, Borneo. We, the last uh, confirmed data that were published about this species was from about 1986. So there is a severe lack of data um, on, on this species and a severe lack of data in general on gibbons in non-protected areas or small forest areas that may also contain viable populations. And this is part of the um, action planning, which I will speak about shortly. I'm just checking my time. So um, on to 
one of uh, Borneo Nature Foundation's main sites, the Sabangau Forest in um, south central Kalimantan. It's an area that unfortunately um, is impacted by forest fires. Uh, some of it can be highly degraded. It's peat swamp forest. It does get fire um, and it does burn. And what we can see, uh, what happens to the gibbons whilst uh, fires are occurring, and of course fires produce smoke, and there is a great deal then of pollution in the atmosphere. This picture here was taken at about 9.30 in the morning, and you can see how bad the smog and pollution is. And what we see is that the average length of singing time significantly reduces uh, during smoke season. We shouldn't call it smoke season, but unfortunately that's now what it's become known as. And the number of days the gibbons sing, in some cases less, uh, more than halves because of the smoke. So we need to think about, I think, and, and this applies, I would believe, I would say to any conservation problem. We have multiple problems for conservation. Therefore, we must think about multiple solutions. Impacts of human threats, conservation projects needed to be implemented at a multi-level scale. Adaptive local conservation management approaches, thinking about local leadership and integration, capacity building and education, on the ground direct conservation efforts and monitoring research or research monitoring. And the last bit I would like to briefly talk about is action planning. Creating action plans for species, um, working, for example, with IUCN or with and or with the conservation planning specialist group of IUCN. The idea behind this is to create um, implementable documents, not simply a report, a report, but a document that is a live document that really does tell you what we need to do to help a particular species. So because of um, COVID, we have been unable to have the face-to-face -face meetings we had hoped for. So everything's being done online and with some incredible people um, across the um, Gibbon habitat range countries who are dedicating so much time and effort to, to put into this. We have a customized Excel spreadsheet that we're using to, uh, to gather data across the 20 species, sorry, again, 11 countries. Um, and the reasons we're doing this, and, and bear with me, I appreciate these are not uh, gibbons, but a very successful um, lemur action plan was produced a few years ago from 2013 to 16. And they were so detailed in what they did and so clear with their intentions and so clear about the um, costs and the actors and who would implement things that they actually raised 8 million euros for the conservation of lemurs in, um, obviously in Madagascar. My hope is we can do same, same for gibbons. And it was a success because all the experts were involved. There was online consultation and in workshops. There was a clear budget for all the actions which were required and a clear responsible organization for all actions. So we've done action plans for, excuse me, orangutans. And this is how we make Gibbons a, su a success. We again include all the experts. We have online consultations and workshops. We have a clear budget, clear responsible organizations, and we identify the government stakeholders to help endorse the plan in all the countries. And this is ongoing at, um, at the moment. Sometimes it results in me being up and or staying up until two o'clock in the morning uh, because of the time difference between Oxford and um, Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam, but you know, anything for the wee apes. So to conclude, we have funds to complete new surveys. We are coordinating, getting country coordinators for the action planning Excel document. We're working with the experts. All of these action plans will be available freely on the SSA website. And the complete action plans and, and, and raising money for this is obviously a hope 
that we will be able to um, achieve. So in conclusion, and just going back to the, uh, the wonderful peat swamps of Borneo, keep the peat wet. If we have wet peat uh, with blocked canals and um, established hydrology, then it's not going to burn. And if it's not burning, it's not resulting in de uh, deforestation and fragmentation. We also need to think about um, sharing achievements at, uh, you know, international primatological society meetings, including Gibbons in the top 25 and the Skywalker Gibbon is in the most recent top 25, but projects must also show how the species has benefited from being on that top 25 list. And we need to think about determining if the criteria to remain on the top 25 list is, is still there. So clear assessments, not subjective emotional uh, determination about a species inclusion or exclusion from the list. And sharing experiences and ideas is crucial. Networking is important. Listening to colleagues, sharing ideas, sharing what works, but equally we must share what doesn't work. And that only from that can we really learn and, and change our um, approach. So if you would like further information, um, the SSA website is gibbons.asia. Gibbonesia, which is the campaign, uh, the online campaign website, is gibbonesia.id. Um, I'm fairly certain most of that website is in Indonesian. But of course, if anyone would like further information, please feel free to um, email me. Um, our sponsors, particularly for the um, wildlife trade aspect of this, the Arcus Foundation, Synchronicity Earth, hugely important collaborators is International Animal Rescue Indonesia. And if you would like further information about Borneo Nature Foundation and our opportunities for field work when we are allowed to resume that, then the information is here. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention um, I'd like to thank again the organizers for inviting me to come along to this, and I would be delighted to take any questions. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for that talk. It was so, so interesting. We had a lot of people watching um, and a lot of questions. So we can jump right into this, the question and answer session. Sure. Um, so to begin with, I've tried to group some of the questions thematically. So we had some early questions on given research generally. So the first is, what would you say are the principal reasons for the comparative lack of research and publications on gibbons versus other apes? Excellent question. Um, honestly, I don't think it is down to a lack of interest. I think it is down to a lack of uh, funding. A lot of funding organizations previously did not, con because gibbons were, were previously classified as lesser apes, and I cringe when I say that, so they're, they're wee apes, small apes, there's nothing lesser about them, but funding organizations did not consider them to be as um, important in understanding human evolution or the environment, and therefore that lack of funding opportunity, I think, meant that uh, there were less opportunities, therefore, for people to go out and study the gibbons and more opportunities for people to go out and study the big apes. So that simply um, moved people off to the, um, the big ape side of things or, or monkeys. Um, they are difficult to follow. There's no getting away from that. They are fast. They are speedy. They are agile. Um, and they don't always live in the most hospitable environments. Um, I, I still remember uh, writing a publication a few years ago mentioning uh, play in Gibbons um, and got some comments back suggesting that Gibbons don't play. And I, they're a primate, they're social. They're like every other primate. We are social, we engage in play, it's how we learn. But many, many, many studies on Gibbons, I think up until the, uh, including the late eighties and late nineties, uh, really focused on their behavioral ecology and didn't didn't spend they were the studies were too short to really go in depth into given behavioral ecology so I think that's probably why and and I think also part of it is um, their distribution uh, when I started my PhD in 2000 
uh, we recognized 12 species. We've now got 20, but we're not increasing species at quite the rate that the lemurs are, but um, you know, their, their availability and distribution of the gibbons is still very, um, it's still developing. Thank you, yeah, and, and all the more reason why this research has to be happening now. Um, so another question that came in about gibbon research is, do we know of a fossil record for gibbons? And if so, does this tell us something about their past geographic distribution? Fabulous question, yes. So what we, um, colleagues of mine that have been doing this work, what we do know is that gibbons used to be up and to, up, distributed up to the middle part of China. Um, and they've actually discovered a gibbon skull in a tomb, um, which I think dates back to about 2,500 years ago. The tomb is meant to, is, is believed to be that of an empress, um, which possibly indicates she had the gibbon as a pet, which is obviously bad for con conservation. Um, but interestingly, uh, looking at it, and if you just bear with me one wee sec, I will get the name of it because I, um, I've totally forgotten. Oh, here it is. Um, Royal Tomb, Fossil Finds. Uh, it's been given a completely new genera, uh, uh, although it is absolutely definitely related to modern day gibbons. Um, Junzi Imperialis, I should have remembered that. Um, so the theory behind the name um, is a nod to the skull's royal roots, as well as um, a nod to the gibbon's role in Chinese mythology of being a very scholarly species. Um, sadly though, fossil records for gibbons are relatively rare. Um, we do know that obviously they share a common ancestor with the other apes, particularly closely common ancestor with the orangutan, and um, but actual fossils is, is really quite rare. Uh, I will, so this is the, it's not the actual scientific publication, but I'll pop this into, the, perhaps you can share this on, on the YouTube. Um, that's the National Geographic article about the publication of Junsi Imperialis. Um, so yes, interest, a very interesting history behind that. Obviously, an, an extremely respected and highly regarded individual buried with many, many different artifacts, including the skull of a gibbon going back two and a half thousand years and a species that it appears is very closely related to the gibbons, but not um, not a gibbon that is currently extant today. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Um, thank you. So now we have some more questions that came in on gibbons in the pet trade. So transitioning into that subject. Um, in your table on annual fluctuations in gibbon trade, what happened in 2018, which made so many people want to sell gibbons? So was there, was there a reason for the spike in 2018? Good question. Um, not that we've been able to determine. Um, because we're not carrying out questionnaires to uh, either the sellers or the buyers, it's difficult to determine um, exactly what the reasons are behind the different spikes. So I'm afraid um, I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. Sorry. That's all right. There are many more. So um, what do you think the next steps are for getting social media companies to police wildlife pet trade? And I know that you said that that's a very difficult, maybe ethical issue for the social media platforms, but what should people do if they come across these posts on social media or how can we put pressure um, as users of these platforms? Great. So like I said, um, reporting them obviously is important. Um, that gets them taken down, which is good. It doesn't then, of course, stop the person coming back and creating a new profile and relisting everything and simply taking new photographs of the individual gibbons or animals for sale. 
Um, the website link that I shared, the Association for Countering Crime, Countering Crime Online, is an exceptionally good platform to be able to share things with. Uh, the more that we report things on Facebook, the more that they are um, working towards taking things down. And obviously there's a, there's a disturbing amount of illegal activity taking place on social media. It's not simply trade in, in, in wildlife, you know, there's um, trade in there's human trafficking, there's, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, and um, the Association for Countering Crime Online has at least did about a year ago, uh, was raising a high court uh, case against Facebook to encourage them to be more vigilant about allowing uh, illegal activity. They're obviously not supporting it, but they are they are still facilitating illegal activity to actually take place on their platforms. Uh, we then had COVID and, you know, we've had the election in the States. So that's unfortunately slightly slipped down the um, list of priorities. But all of these things are um, being catalogued and, and are something that is going to be raised with the, I think it's the Supreme Court in the States. Um, Elodie's nodding, so I think I've said that right, the Supreme Court. Uh, so that's, um, that's, that's sort of the next step. But one of the other things that can be done is... Um, is as, as well as reporting uh, in, inappropriate content to Facebook, take images of these and especially if it's got a gibbon uh, on it, share with me. I'm compiling a database of, of online trade um, across different countries, not only Indonesia. It's obviously Indonesia's where we're piloting the um, campaign. So yes, I hope that helps. It does. Thank you. Um, okay, so so what are some of the challenges in rehabilitating gibbons? So, and I know you mentioned differences in foliage and regional differences, but what are some of the logistics of housing and socializing gibbons that are rescued? Um, there are dietary problems. There can be socializing problems, there can be behavioral problems, and there can be physiological problems. Um, you know, I've, I've dealt with gibbons who've got um, severe distress issues relating to isolation, so they display stereotypic behavior. And unless you can actually reduce that, um, they're not going to be suitable to be returned to the wild. And this is not uh, unique to gibbons, it happens to most, most primates, but they end up with a reverse Tarzan complex. I shall explain. Tarzan grew up thinking he was a chimp. These primates have grown up thinking they're humans. So when they see another individual of the same species, they quite often panic. They don't know how to interact, they don't have the social skills, they just don't know what to do. Um, Equally uh, with gibbons, they live, you know, they live in, in bonded pairs in the wild. Um, and it's very complicated to try to reintroduce gibbons to each other in captivity because three things could happen. They'll either uh, ignore each other. Um, they'll either kind of groom a wee bit and just sort of hang out and, um, no, sorry, they'll ignore each other, groom a wee bit, but hang out like flatmates. They will bond, uh, groom, and then obviously copulate and display appropriate um, mated pair behavior, or they will try and kill each other. At which point you obviously have to intervene immediately and separate them. Big canines, long teeth, much possibility of um, you know, injury. And they're very picky. It's not a simple case of going, here is a male, here is a female, let's put them together. Doesn't work like that. Um, so, you know, managing the social, the behavioral, the psychological um, aspects of rehabilitation can be quite 
it, it is it is complicated and has to be done carefully, slowly, has to be monitored. And of course, once the gibbons are returned back to the forest, there must be must be post-release monitoring. And on piggybacking off of that, is there any long-term data on translocation and its effectiveness? And um, is there any information or data on the impact that this may have on local species biodiversity? And what steps are in place to assess or model this when translocation is, is considered? Translocation is a complicated one about gibbons because it's been done so infrequently. Most of the cases that we know of are really from India where we've had gibbons in highly fragmented um, habitats that have had to be moved to, um, to new forests. I would honestly say there's still a fairly large lack of data about that particular aspect of things. Rehabilitation and reintroduction of ex-pet gibbons that are taken out of the pet trade and returned to the wild, we know a great deal more about. When, it when we're talking about wild to wild translocations, we have limited um, information. But what I am going, uh, if I can find the website, um, so the best practice guidelines on rehabilitation and translocation of gibbons um, is available on the, uh, the SSA website. And again, I'm going to pop the link into the chat. Um, I don't know if you can share any of this on YouTube, but um, we shall see. Uh, and these guidelines are currently available in pretty much every language in which we have gibbons um and again free to download and it, it we do discuss translocation but it is unfortunately um a, a technique that has been not tested as much as we probably would like translocations um and rescues of wild orangutans have got far more, they've got far more experience having done that with, with them than, than we have with Gibbons. So it's still a learning curve. Absolutely. Um, so now we have some more questions on methods of conservation. Um, so one, and this is sort of a clustered question, but do you think we need a totally new framework for conservation that is mostly focused on human development and targeting poverty and basic essentials in communities sharing space with these primates. And another question came in as well, which was specifically with gibbons. Um, what are the perceptions of humans who share ecological spaces um, with Hainan gibbons? And how does this, in your opinion, influence conservation action plans? Oh, um, all good questions. Um, I'll come to the Hainan question first. One of the key things that, that my colleagues have been doing is looking at local ecological knowledge about the Hainan gibbon and using that to be able to work backwards to understand the Hainan gibbon's past distribution and to try and understand why it's ended up with such a tiny population in a tiny part of a national nature reserve. What's, you know, what's happened? Um, what has resulted in this drastic, um, catastrophic even, decline in um, numbers of gibbons, numbers of Hainan gibbons. When it comes to working with local communities, uh, in fact, not even just local communities, people in general, I am very much an advocate of including humans in the conservation conversation. There are so few places left in the world that could be considered to be truly wild without human influence. Humans are influencing the environment so much that we must include them in the conversation. We must include the stakeholders. We must include the hunters, the poachers, the everybody that we can think of in order to be able to build up the best picture for creating cons a conservation framework. Equally, all of those people, um, need to be ideally, I hope, engaged with outreach programs that are um, talking about the wildlife. Um, 
it's always something that I think is is difficult to get across. So, okay, so um, Christmas a couple of years ago, uh, orangutan, um, the, the Iceland advert. Am I I'm, I'm possibly using too many cultural references, but th there was an advert uh, where I, the Iceland promoted, uh, which is a uh, supermarket chain in the UK, not the country. And it was actually an, a video put together by Greenpeace and voiced by Emma Thompson. And it was about an orangutan, a small orangutan, whose environment had been chopped down. And they went to the home of a small girl to ask for help. Rang orangutan, I think it was called. And um, that uh, campaign had several interesting outcomes. I'm going off on a wee tangent. I do this. Um, one was that it had a it had resonance, great resonance, with the Western world. But when we have done with with Borneo Nature Foundation, when we've looked at what people consider to be important in our education network, you know, they see orangutan as simply just another part of the environment. They don't see orangutans as particularly special, any more special than any other wildlife. What's important to them is the forest and the ecosystem services. What also came out of that advert, uh, sorry, that, that um, Greenpeace campaign was condemnation from Indonesia because the problem was the little girl was white, not Indonesian. Why would an orangutan come to a white little girl to seek help instead of going to an Indonesian? And so, you know, there were there were multiple problems. I mean, the message itself was, I think, you know, it was very hard hitting, and um, I think it was good. But from the Indonesian point of view, it was like, well, this is just another another whitewashing thing, another white savior type uh, campaign. Uh, why was the little girl not uh, a little Indonesian girl who could who could reach out and um, protect the orangutan? So, yeah, I've gone on a rant. Sorry. Next question. No problem at all. Very interesting rant. Um, so I think we are over time, but uh, and there's so many more questions that that were asked and that I want to know the answers to. But just to end for the last one. Um, on a success story story, if there, if there are any. So the question is, 2020 was a difficult year in many ways. Do you have something positive or exciting that came out of last year pertaining to Gibbons and their conservation? Gosh, um, an excellent question again. Um, you know what? I think, yes, we got... Um, we have had so much engagement with the action planning process. We have had so much engagement with people wanting to be online and provide their, their, their knowledge and their expertise to the action planning process. We have had so many people wanting to, um, you know, uh, raise money and raise awareness and do online webinars and Zooms to talk about wildlife conservation and, and Gibbons in particular we've been able to reach through the internet an, a wider audience than we ever could have done. Uh, through my, the NGO that I, I co-direct and, and help run in, in Indonesia, we've had to adapt our outreach and education programs to being online. We've now got a studio in our offices we're doing podcasts, we're doing webinars, we're sharing content with, with students and our different age groups online. Um, it's not the same as doing things face to face, obviously, but that sort of adaptation has been, I think the, the willingness to adapt of the conservation practitioners has really been quite exceptional and the willingness of the students to engage with it has been exceptional as well. Um, so, yeah, it's not, uh, we, obviously, we, we uh, with the, the primates that I 
normally uh, my team normally follows in Indonesia we haven't done uh follows since probably April last year because obviously we're considering the implications of close proximity we have no contact they're totally wild animals but we maintain a, a distance of at least 50 meters and we want to make sure that that uh, our health is uh, our health and the health of the primates is paramount um but I think you know, especially during in my okay, my own personal experience in first lockdown in the UK, people got out more, people enjoyed the outdoors more, people listened to bird song in the morning, people engaged with the environment. And I think that broader context of listening to the environment, engaging with it, being part of it, I hope is something we will take forward going beyond the pandemic whether it's given specific or not. I just hope we all have a better appreciation and care for our natural world. Thank you. I think that's very well said. And I think it's true. I hope that that kind of appreciation for the outdoors and nature persists as we move forward. So thank you again, Susan. This has been so interesting and the responses have been so positive. So thank you for joining us. Next week, a reminder for our talk, we have Aaron Westling, who will be speaking at 4 p.m. on February 9th on contextualizing the chimpanzee niche, how Savannah Mosaic Chimpanzee Ecology can offer uh, insights into human evolution and beyond. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Susan, for your talk. You are most welcome. Thank you all for joining. Um, please take great care and uh, join, you know, go onto the SSA website, learn about the Gibbons, and um, if you've got any kids that you're interested in, uh, you know, giving something to, get them to sing like a given. It's going to be fascinating. <laughs> <laughs>